Hi, and welcome to the Assemblines Podcast. I'm Chris Torrance. So today I want to take a look at how to debug and repair old computers. So let's get started. So I want to give a shout out to Logan and Jeffrey Davis who have been posting lately on the Facebook Apple II Enthusiast page about trying to repair an Apple II Plus computer which is acting up. And so this got me thinking about the different techniques and tricks needed to repair an old computer. So we're gonna take a look at what makes it so hard to repair a modern computer, say a MacBook, versus repairing an older computer, say an Apple IIc. I'll be using the Apple II computer as a reference point, but all of these techniques should apply to any computer from the late 70s and 80s. So why is it so difficult to work on modern computers compared to old ones? The main difference in size. On the left you can see a Raspberry Pi computer which has about a thousand times the power of this Apple II over on the right here. But it's also probably a thousand times harder to work on it. So you can see the components in this thing are just microscopic. So here's some resistors for example. Here's the main CPU here. And this is probably a RAM chip over here. And to be able to work on this, you really need either a magnifying glass or you just give up and throw the whole thing away and just buy a new one. Here are most of the tools that I have on my workbench when I'm working on old computers. So first and most importantly, you need to have some sort of reference material for your particular computer. So here, for example, I've got the Apple II reference manual as well as the Apple II circuit description. Then you'll want a bunch of standard tools, screwdrivers, pliers, wire cutters. I've got a chip puller, although you can use a screwdriver in some cases. And then I also have a Sharpie for labeling things. And then finally you get into more of the electronics things. So I've got a soldering station here and as well as some solder and a brass cleaner kit there. And then I've got a multimeter and to go along with that I've got some alligator clips as well as some tiny little test IC clips. And then finally, optionally, but probably useful, is a logic probe. And this lets you look at signals inside your computer and see whether they're behaving properly or not. The key about all of this is you don't have to buy really expensive things. So for example, this is a 30 watt soldering iron, but I do have it on a soldering station. And so that gives me plenty of power to actually desolder or solder anything in the computer. My multimeter is just a cheap kind of off the shelf one. The key with the multimeter is you want to get one so when you're testing continuity, it beeps. Some of the really cheap ones don't beep at all and those are just really hard to use because you just need that auditory signal that you're getting continuity. And then finally for the logic probe, this is just a cheap off the shelf one. So that's about it for what you need to get started. Now let's take a look at some techniques for how to diagnose problems. There's two types of ways that circuits are mounted onto a circuit board. And the modern technique uses surface mount components. And this just means that, for example, if you look at this Raspberry Pi, all of the little components like the resistors and the chips are mounted directly on top of the circuit board and they're soldered to little pads on the surface of the circuit board. And this just makes it really easy for modern machines to assemble these by just placing the components and automatically soldering them. Contrast that to older computers where they typically use through-hole soldering. So in this case, your components, say chips or resistors or capacitors, they actually mount through holes called vias and they go directly through the board to the other side. These are considerably easier to work on, although obviously they take up a lot more room. So let's talk about how these boards actually work. So this is a typical printed circuit board. This is a super serial card from the Apple. Same principles apply for say the Apple II. This is just a little bit easier to take a look at. These circuit boards are typically made out of some sort of resin impregnated cloth or paper. And so they are non-conductive. Embedded within the boards are very thin copper wires that go between the mount points for the chips. 
So for example, you can see here, I've got the leg of one chip and then there's a very thin wire coming out and it goes to this leg on this other chip. Now this is a two layer board because you can see we've got copper wires embedded here on the top, but if we flip it over, we can see we also have copper wires, which are also called traces on the bottom. And so all of these chips, when they go into the board, then the wires will come out of either the top or the bottom and they'll just get routed to the appropriate other chip or to the power supply or wherever they need to go. Let's talk about the standard components of a computer. So this here is a Rev Zero Apple II, but the same thing will apply to any computer from that time period. So typically you'll have some sort of power supply here and this can either be built into the computer itself like this, or it might be a separate brick and then you have a proprietary cable that plugs into the computer. And then you've got the power supply routed somehow into the motherboard. Here it's directly on the surface. You might have a plug in the back of your computer. And then finally, you're gonna have some sort of video output. Here, for example, it's a composite video output. And then you'll have some sort of keyboard input. Then you might also have peripherals. So for example, here we have a built-in speaker that plugs into the motherboard. We also have a joystick or paddle connector back here. We've got cassette in and out. And then finally we have slots where we can plug in additional expansions. So what are some things to look for when you first get a computer that isn't working? Probably step number one is to just take apart the case and look at the motherboard itself. In a lot of these old computers, the only thing that's gone wrong is maybe a capacitor has blown. So a lot of these old capacitors, so for example, here are some capacitors here, and they typically have a shape that looks something like a upside down U, and these can get old and actually leak. And so that's a really obvious thing to look for is, is there a capacitor on the board that is either swollen or is already leaked? Or another example is, do you have a battery on your board, say for a clock, and has that leaked all over the board? So those are really obvious things. And then if you don't see anything obvious, it's time to start digging a little bit deeper. And so other things to look for are chips that are either not in their sockets in the correct direction. So for example, if you'll look here on this board, all of the chips have their notch pointed in the downward direction. And this is indicated on the board through the silk screen, just so you can be sure. So make sure all the chips are facing in the correct direction. And then with a lot of these older boards, what happens over time is with thermal expansion as you turn them on and off, the chips will actually slowly become unseated and they'll just kind of move up a tiny bit and make a bad connection. So one way to easily fix one of these old computers is just go through and press down on all of the chips and make sure that they're all seated properly. And you can hear as I'm doing that, that some of these actually weren't properly seated. And so just by pressing down on them, you can actually sometimes fix a lot of problems. Okay, if that doesn't do it, then another thing to look for is examining the board much more closely and seeing is there some subtle damage that you didn't notice. So for example, look at the traces here on the board and see if all of them look obvious. Now if you recall from my earlier episode, on this particular board, that was actually the problem, is the trace here underneath this D0 ROM was broken just right here as if somebody had maybe dropped like a screwdriver on it. Okay, so that was a really, really subtle uh, but easily fixable problem. Other things that can go wrong, chips can actually burn out. So you might occasionally find RAM chips that are bad or other chips that have gone bad. Sometimes you can actually tell by turning on the computer and just feeling the chips to see is one particularly hot compared to the other ones. Now, a lot of times in these old computers, they'll all be hot but some cases you can actually tell one is much, much hotter than another one, and that's typically a suspect chip, although not always. Let's say you're ready to dive in and start diagnosing the problem with your computer. There are some things you should do at the very beginning to avoid problems. So first of all, make sure that the power is off and everything is unplugged, and then remove any peripheral cards that might be in the computer. And to do this on the Apple, you just simply lift up very carefully and gently remove it. You don't need any sort of tool to remove cards from the slots. And then you might also consider removing any unnecessary ROM or RAM if you really can't figure out what the problem is. 
So for example, on the Apple II and II Plus, all you need is the F8 ROM. So this is the very first one here. So you can actually remove all of the other ROMs from the computer, and this should get you to at least the minimal boot and beep. You can also remove the last two banks of RAM to leave the computer with only 16K of RAM. And so that's just this row here. And this can sometimes actually eliminate some problems in case there's a bad RAM chip. Finally, on some computers, you should be able to disconnect the keyboard as well and then disconnect anything else like a joystick. And this just makes sure that you don't have some sort of short or something in your keyboard or one of your peripherals that's causing the problem. So once you have everything completely disassembled, taken apart, all the cards are removed, then you can go ahead and plug in the power and try it out. Let's talk about power supplies and safety real quick. So here is the power supply for the Apple II, and you'll notice that this is enclosed in a case with a label on it saying do not open. And this is actually for a good reason. So there are some high voltage components in here. Specifically, this has 120 volts of current coming into it. Yours might be 220 depending on where you are. And then that gets filtered through the line filters here and then gets transformed to the voltages needed by the computer. So these voltages can actually injure or kill you if you're not careful. So make sure to always unplug the power supply before attempting to work on it. And remember that these capacitors can actually store charge for quite a long time. So try to avoid touching any of these components. Now, when looking at the power supplies, one of the main things that fails is these giant filtering capacitors over here, as well as this fuse. So if your power supply doesn't seem to be working at all, then you could take two different steps. You could either try and open it up and look to see is there a component that's broken, such as a fuse or one of the capacitors, and just replace it yourself. Or a possible better alternative is just buy a new power supply. And these actually, these power supplies typically supply voltages like plus and minus five volts, plus and minus 12 volts. And surprisingly, they actually are still available but in a much smaller form. So for example, here's a kit sold by Henry Corbis at Ultimate Micro, and this is just a drop-in replacement for a Apple power supply. Your computer probably uses something similar to this, and you just need to do some research on the web. So if you're reasonably confident that the power supply works, then you can go ahead and start trying to measure voltages or continuity on the board. In this episode, we took a look at some basic diagnostics that you can do on your retro computer, and we took a look at the problems that can go wrong with your printed circuit board, as well as your power supply. In the next episode, we'll take a look at how to use a multimeter to do some continuity and voltage testing. So, thanks for watching.